Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, I don't know what to expect uh, with the audience because I heard it's quite diverse. So, um, like, this is not a really academic type of lecture, but I will provide with some, some interesting information uh, to learn more about medical devices. Um, Michael mentioned a few times about biomedical engineering. So, my talk, um, I'll start to talk about biomedical engineering, um, talk about medical device industry, which is my area focused, and then we'll look at two devices uh, to illustrate how important is physics uh, in medical devices, right? You got into a hospital nowadays, right? You saw a lot of medical devices. So these are all based on physics and math and chemistry, basically science, right? Science and math. Um, so these, I'll go back, these two devices are, one is Doppler ultrasound flow detector, uh, the other one is pulse oximeter. I'll show you a little bit more on that later. So what is biomedical engineering? Any, anyone heard about this term, biomedical engineering? Raise your hand. So many of you have not heard about it. So I'll spend a little bit of time to talk about biomedical engineering. And BC now, is, there's a vibrant community of biomedical engineers doing a lot of very interesting research and then eventually turn into uh, products as well as technology to help in all different areas. Um, so what the, the field of biomedical engineering is very broad. Um, it can be um, like in genetic engineering, it can be in tissue engineering, growing tissues, um, or even like you heard about some, somewhere that they, they actually can grow a heart out from in the lab, right? Um, also microfluidic, using very f small um, uh, fluid to do a lot of amazing things, right? Uh, like um, 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 a point of, um, point of care, right? you can get a small device like uh, to the patient and they can measure all, all your blood uh, gases, blood, blood chemistry or whatever. And then uh, of course biomaterial, right? Different type of the, the uh, implant, tissues, etc. And for myself, I am in medical device technology, medical devices. So what, what are medical devices? For example, anyone Notice what it is? You know what it is? So what, what, what is this? You don't? Okay. It's an X-ray, X-ray machine, right? Right? Um, if you went to ski, you hurt yourself, bump into a tree or whatever, the first thing they will put you on is this one, right? To see if you have any broken bones or whatever. Um, this is a, a SPEC CT. Um, which is a uh, CT scanner that can do a uh, whole body scan to look at what is your internal organ, but also is combined with SPAC, single positron emission tomography. It injects some radioisotope into the body, and then the isotope will emit gamma radiation. And from that, you can uh, merge the, the two image, CT image together, for example, to localize uh, some cancer tissues or, or something. So this is our... Uh, um, uh, one of the imaging equipment that are that are like uh, ha have a very high demand in terms of healthcare. Um, this is a handheld ultrasound scanner. I should have brought 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 it to show and tell. Um, this is one that was designed, built in locally in BC. Um, they were sort of struggling for many years until the COVID struck. They have high demands of ultrasound scanners um, for, to look at the lungs and whatever damage. So this company produced this portable handheld unit. They have problem actually, well, I wouldn't say they have problem, but it's the sales was not too great because in the hospital, they were relying on this huge uh, um, scanners that may cost um, like 30, 40, um, $100,000, right, a unit. 
uh, and it's big, clunky. So when COVID struck, there is a huge demand of this for handheld scanner for, for uh, clinicians to scan the lung. So they, they actually expand crazy. They are hiring many, many people now. Uh, it's a local uh, PC gun. It's, and it's selling internationally, not just, not just in Canada. So it's one of the successful stories in terms of medical devices uh, in a uh, company in, in BC. And there are, there are more that are actually rising company as well. Um, anyone know what's this? A pacemaker, I heard, right? Anyone has a pacemaker in the audience? Or know someone who has a pacemaker? Yeah? Well, there are, actually it's quite a common device nowadays, right? Um, I have a pacemaker. Actually, in fact, I have many of them. So I brought one just to give you some perspective. Oh, this is a small, tiny one. It implanted totally into your, your body, under the skin. And then there's a lead that also inside, uh, under your skin, to get into the heart. Uh, send an electrical signal to stimulate the heart to, to beat. And it also senses your heart condition, so it won't stimulate your heart until your heart failed to, to beat. So this is one, one, one of the medical devices. Um, okay, so um, I hope I'm not telling too many stories. Um, this pacemaker was invented by a Canadian. Um, name is Jack Hop. Um, who are 40, the um, Americans say, well, they actually first invented it, but, well, if you look internationally, people consider Jeb as the inventor of pacemaker. And Jeb is the founder of my professional association, Canadian Medical and Biological Engineering Society. Okay, I think a lot of you know what it is, right? You watch, if you watch, ever watch TV, this ER, hospital, whatever, you've seen these people people using this. This is a cardiac pacemaker. Um, these are a, a fleet of anesthesia machine um, that puts patients sort of to sleep before they, uh, they get into surgery so that they don't feel it or, or whatever. So these are examples of hospital medical devices. We also have equipment at home, right? You have all, I think most of you have at least a thermometer at home, electronic thermometer. That's a medical device. And uh, non-invasive blood pressure, cough. Uh, many people are getting home dialysis equipment, which is a very complicated equipment. They are having it at home. Also, just want to bring you out. This is a lady. Unfortunately, she passed away about five years ago. Um, Michael mentioned I'm a founder of this uh, organization, Technology for Living, which one of the programs that we have is to provide technology for people that have the disability so they can live independently. So um, it used to be um, people with her condition, basically she is a quadriplegic. Um, not quite quadriplegic, paraplegic. She can still move her head. She can have a little bit of function on, your, on, your, on her head. But um, used to be this type of patient will need to be staying in the hospital or care environment. But like our organization started about 20 years ago, uh, we provide technology for these people to move out of the hospital. Actually, they are staying at the home. So we provide them with technology. For example, what technology? Um, we have, well, wheelchair is one, right? And she can drive her wheelchair using this sip and puff controller that she's uh, uh, breathe out air, suck in air, and then using that sequence to code uh, 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 some coding to, to uh, drive the wheelchair. So she could actually go down from the elevator, go to the street, and stroll along the, the pathway by herself. Don't, doesn't need anyone to, to be with her. Um, and she could not breathe by herself. So she relied on a medical device, which is uh, called ventilator, to push air in and out of the lung. So she has that mount on the wheelchair uh, 24 hours a day, seven hours a week, like she's relying on this life supporting equipment for her. So, um, like these are medical devices that allow people to live independently. Um, now, 
I, I can see is like these type of technology is not just for people with disability. Um, as we age, like I'm, I'm aging, sooner or later I may have difficulty even climbing a flight of stairs or whatever. So there are a lot of these medical devices that will be able to help people to, to be independent rather than rely on someone to help them. Um, so medical device technology, actually most of them, the ideas come from university settings, right, or research labs. So UBC has a, now a big school of biomedical engineering, same as SFU, UWIC, and whatever. So people are doing research, and then if they come up with some brilliant idea that is promising, it will be moved to the industry. The industry will, will, will fine tune it, and then generate uh, medical devices that I, I mentioned earlier. And then afterwards, it will be deployed in the in the healthcare or home environment to be used. So in terms of the biomedical engineering proportion in medical device area, we have these biomedical engineers uh, doing basic research, applied research, and also application. And we call this technology transfer. Right? So, um, so now we're getting back to what I supposed to be to, <laughs> to ask you to do. Um, talk about the physics in medical devices. So I brought two devices, um, a pulse oximeter and a Doppler blood flow detector. I'm going to talk about it. Uh, what's their sort of application and then get into a little bit about the physics behind it. Okay. So the first device is a Doppler ultrasound scanner, or detector, this is not a scanner, sorry. So a Doppler scanner uh, is using ultrasound. to non-invasively detect blood flow in a blood vessel. So what's the application? For example, um, well, someone is eating too much hamburger every day, right? The blood vessel is getting to be cropped, right? Getting thinner, smaller, and eventually it will be, it will cause some problem. So this device can easily um, detect the blood flow, basically the blood flow velocity in, in an artery or, or vein, okay? Without actually cutting open and exposing and looking at it. So this is, can be used in a clinic or, or even your doctor's office if they have one. Um, anyone want to try this? Okay. Okay, come on up. So a little bit messy. Uh, you can sit down, you can sit down, yeah. Um, okay, well, we'll see. So if any ultrasound type of devices, uh, you may notice it requires some sort of gel. So the gel in terms of physics is to match the acoustic impedance. Because if you have two different, very different acoustic impedance, the sound travel and most of it will be reflected. It won't penetrate. So the gel is to provide a layer of matching impedance so that it can um, uh, pass through. And then uh, the ultrasound, this one I'm talking about, is detecting the refracted ultrasound from within your body, reflected on the cell, whatever. Detecting that, you can uh, look at, uh, for this one, uh, find out what is the blood flow uh, velocity for that. So I need to apply, put some gels in, on. Let's look at here. Just a little bit. Mm. 
Are you here? I just have coffee. Well, it's not the talk inside. <laughs> okay, so this is how, how it works. So now, um, uh, can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if we have time after, afterwards, if you are interested, you can come and try it out. <laughs> okay. Um, now, what this is tell is if your say your artery, say the carotid artery is branched into two, right? Uh, sometimes, right, one branch may be blocked, right? So you can the uh, physician can trace the carotid artery and then at bifurcation see uh, look at like if there is any blood flow in one or whatever. And if the other thing is if the blood flow velocity is fast, it actually generates a higher pitch or higher frequency. So you can tell um, by listening to the, to the frequency or the pitch of the sound, how fast the blood flow. So if your blood vessel, most of it are clogged, then the area, that section that allows blood to go through will be very small. And then the velocity will be fast, right? So if you trace along the, the, the artery and then all of a sudden you can hear very high pitch sound, that means that that particular section is uh, is is restricted, so that's that's the sort of the the idea of the diagnosis using this uh, device. So, what is the basic principle, physics principle on that? Um, is ultrasound? So, what is ultrasound? Sound above twenty kHz uh, in general that is beyond the human hearing, um, and. It's the other property of sound is it requires media to propagate, right? It won't travel in vacuum. Um, this is the equation relating to the wavelengths uh, of sound, the velocity of sound traveling. So in air, it's 330 meters per second. In soft tissue, it's about 1,500 meters per second. Uh, this is the frequency of sound. So this device is based on what we call Doppler effect. Any student or people have learned what is Doppler effect in your physics? Yeah? So, okay. So Doppler effect is if you have a source, frequency source, emitting a certain frequency, right? If you have a receiver, either yourself or a detector, when the two is traveling at different speed, the frequency received by the receiver will be either increased or decreased from the original sound frequency. So that's the Doppler effect. And what is the um, sort of the phenomenon that you may notice is, I don't know if I... Now this is the equation, right? The source frequency, the receiver frequency, and this is the top, the re receiver frequency. It's modified by the um, um, real, uh, speed of the receiver as well as the speed of the of the source. So if both are stationary, you can tell that F R is equal to F uh, F S, which they are the same. If it started moving, it would be different. Um, so uh, I'll try to see rather than talk about it. Um, there is a YouTube video. Hopefully, it will run. I'm going to just use the first part. So, um, okay. The Doppler effect. Okay, so you can hear. Um, so how can I get rid of this? So you can hear the, the, the car is honking, right? Put on the horn. Uh, and when it's approaching you, the frequency according to this equation will be higher. If it passes you, the frequency of the sound will become lower. So you notice that there is a change in frequency when the car approaching you and leaving you. So that's the Doppler effect. And in astronomy, they look at the spinning of, the, of some planet and then using the color right, of, the, of the light. To, uh, to actually can, can measure the rotational speed of, of some uh, uh, astronomical object. So that's uh, um, 
um, physics that you may or may not have learned, or well, if you are in science, you will learn about this. So now, how do we apply to produce this type of device that I show you? Now, this is a, a blood vessel. Imagine the blood is flowing in this direction. Um, this is the ultrasound transmitter. This is a receiver. The sound come down, but now, like this is not moving relative to each other, both are stationary. But what is moving is the blood. So we're relying on the blood cells, right, red blood cells as refractor. So the sound traveling from the transmitter hit the moving red blood cell and then will be refracted and picked up by this transducer. So the, there will be a Doppler shift because of the movement of the red blood cell. So with that, I'm not going in, like trying to talk about all this equation, but there is already available on, on, online and in, in uh, books. So what you get is, at the end, you get this particular equation, right? Uh, which is FD is the Doppler shift. What is Doppler shift? is like you have your sound original frequency, your receive frequency, the shift is the difference between the two. It's the change of frequency because of the moving object. You can look at this equation now. The Doppler shift is equal to V, this is the uh, angle, cosine theta, cosine phi, uh, divided by the speed of sound uh, and times by the source frequency. Now this is a constant, the source frequency, you can adjust it, uh, it's a constant, C is a constant. Um, Cosine theta and cosine phi, you can place it so that it will be a constant. So what it shows you is the Doppler shift is now proportional to the flow of blood, the velocity of blood, right? Now one challenge now is, well, I'm showing you this, it is on both sides of the blood vessel. And in fact, there are some devices that use invasively that are configured like that. You expose the blood vessel, you put the sensor on top, put the sensor at the bottom, and then you can measure the blood flow velocity, right, across. But um, this device I'm showing you is non-invasive, so we cannot do that. So what happened is, um, here, we put it, the, out, the transmitter, receiver is put on the single chip, like single area. So it needs some engineering design to get the transmitter and package together. Um, so the sound will transmit here, refracted by the moving blood vessel, come back to the receiver. So we basically get the same, same sort of uh, relationship. Um, with this, now we don't have two angles, so this will be an equation like this, right? Again, this FD is proportional to V, the velocity. So this is being implemented in, in this device. By, we choose, we know C, uh, we sort of know what will be the angle, right? And then we can choose FS, the sound frequency, ultrasound frequency, so that FD will be in the audible region that we can hear. So this one, um, I forgot what is this. So this sound transmitter is eight megahertz, right? So with that, with the um, blood flow velocity is about um, um, less than one meter per second, right? And the sound velocity I mentioned earlier, if you remember, is uh, about 1500 meter per second. So with that, FD will be within the audible frequency range of the, of the individual. So you can actually listen to your, your, your blood, right? But for, um, this device actually can switch to another frequency. It can monitor the fetal heartbeat as well. If someone is pregnant, of course. <laughs> um, what's my time now? Okay, so um, this is what like when the engineers come, well, learn about this idea during one the design phase, they will uh, uh, draft out this um, functional block diagram or architectural block diagram so that they can go through 
the design process and then uh, uh, get into different like all other source or design their own component to to get the uh, device being produced and manufactured. Um, now, well, this is what we call non-invasive device. Compared to a lot of physiological measurement, including blood flow velocity, the most accurate, for example, measuring blood flow is we just get into a blood vessel, put a flow meter in, right, and measure. That will be the most accurate. But oftentimes, we don't want to do that. Why? Why? Yeah. There might not need for this? Pardon me? There might, might be no need for this. The person might be having other issues other than yeah. the blood flow. Well, it can, yeah, yeah, right. It, you, when you insert something in, it may affect the blood flow. It also is painful. No one wants to be cut open. To well, when you go to your doctor's office, well, you don't expect to be cut open and then try to measure. Another thing is, you like this open procedure, right? Has a risk of, say, for example, infection, right? Like that can be very serious, especially when you are dealing with blood vessels. Um, so non-invasiveness is preferred, uh, but often you don't get the accuracy as invasive procedure. So you have this blood pressure cuff that you these are non-invasive, but it's not as accurate as if you actually measure the blood pressure inside a blood vessel. But so for this device, there are a number of things, right? You, if you know your physics, you know a flow. Right, if a, this is the, the a flow pipe, a flow tube, right? Not all, if you look at different segments across the cross section, not all fluid are flowing at the same velocity, right? We have laminar flow, we have turbulent flow. So that gives you an error in, into that. Um, your sound output, therefore, is a combination of many flow frequencies, it's not a single frequency. And also the acquisition angle you put in, the like angle actually affects the frequency. So you, you may not be, say you hope it's 45 degrees, but it, it may not be. And also there's also vessel wall movement. Why, why is vessel wall move, uh, will move? It's because of the pressure, right? Your blood pressure increase, your vessel is not a steel pipe, right? So it will increase the diameter, decrease the diameter, and that will affect the flow. That will uh, produce what? Uh, uh, some error into the measurement. So in terms of biomedical engineering designing this device, we have to look into the errors and see whether or not well, whatever you conceptualize actually will work or if there's so, so high inaccuracy or error that it will render it not that useful. That's talking about the application and the limitation of the device. So the second device that um, I brought is a pulse oximeter. Anyone that has a pulse oximeter? No? <laughs> you have what, what watch? An Apple? <laughs> so even Samsung cell phone, right? One of these, I don't know whether the newest one or whatever. You, you can use a cell phone to act as a pulse oximeter. So I brought one here. So anyone want to try? Okay. So this is a pulse oximeter we bought a year, a number of years ago. Can I have a finger? Yes. Okay. So it will be interesting to see. Just cool still. Okay. Well, it still works. Um, like 98% is the oxygen saturation. She is totally healthy, right? Nice. Um, yeah. And then her heart rate, she's getting excited <laughs> be because I think I'm getting close to her, right? 94 <laughs> beats per minute. Excited to be healthy. So, does you feel pain? You feel no, anything? No, nothing. Well, nothing at all, right? So, this device, I can tell you, uh, in the early 80s, when it was first introduced into the healthcare, right, a device like this, although it's, it's not looking like this, cost almost $10,000. Okay? 
Uh, just a probe alone is about $700. I knew because I've been buying this probe replacement because people abused it and they, they didn't work after six months or whatever. Um, nowadays, this one I got, I use it when I was uh, doing exercise running on my treadmill. Similar thing, um, mostly more accurate and reliable than the first generation. How much do you think it cost? Uh, I just looked at, yesterday I was at London Drugs, $39. Okay, so same thing, right? You put your finger in and then it will measure your, your pulse rate as well as your uh, oxygen level in your blood. So, what is the significance of measuring oxygen level in the blood? Um, for example, um, patient getting into surgery, right? They, are, they cannot breathe, they rely on the ventilator to get oxygen in and out of the, the, the body. Um, and then this is closely watching the vital signs. Um, but one of the important parameter is look at the oxygen level in the blood. Because you can have the machine looks like it's running, but the, but the gas, oxygen gas may not be able to get into the patient body for whatever reason, right? So that's one of the ultimate parameter that you want to determine. So uh, in, before this was used, they have oxygen analyzer put into the gas stream, but it's not measuring what is inside the body. So they, people will have to draw a sample of blood send it to the lab, and then hopefully the lab will do it quick and return the information back into the anesthetist. But oftentimes, if there's a problem, the turnaround time may be 15, 20 minutes, that can be already fatal or create very serious damage to the patient, right? The brain death or brain damage or whatever. So this is sort of a, quite a revolutionary device that you can, um, non-invasively monitor the oxygen saturation level in the patient's artery. Um, not only that, it's continuous monitoring, right? Whereas before, it's a sample. You just do a sample intermittent monitoring and maybe every 15 minutes you can get a result, but, but this is continuous. Um, now with the, the anesthetist uh, uh, guideline, this is a requirement to drink uh, uh, surgery to have a pulse oximeter. And the other thing that I mentioned about COVID is um, this device was selling like hot cake during the COVID because one of the uh, problems with COVID people contract COVID is the lung function, right? Uh, the lung is getting oxygen into your body. So people actually get this and there are some recommendations if your SpO2 is below 90 for 92 um, percent, you should be concerned, right? Because you may be have lung damage because of the COVID or whatever. So again, if people are interested to look at this, I put it here. So now, pulse oximeter, um, medical device do not invasively measure the oxygen saturation level in the arterial blood. So where's the artery? Your finger has a lot of capillaries, so those are considered arterial blood. So it's measuring these, um, um, uh, like what, it, like uh, the oxygen saturation level in, in this blood. So this is a uh, pulse oximal finger probe. This is similar to the one that I showed you. Right. Um, before we move on, a few definitions. Uh, some of you may know, some of you may be um, some foreign language. Oxyhemoglobin is, well, your hemoglobin is the, is the cells or the, or the blood cells that carries oxygen around your body. So oxyhemoglobin is the hemoglobin that is attached. Uh, oxygen is attached, so that it will be just like a car, right? Take some passenger from point A to point B. Um, when oxygen is removed, um, it's called the oxyhemoglobin. And the, there are other hemoglobin inside your blood. 
So the one that we concern about oxygen transport, we call the functional hemoglobin. Basically, it's the oxygen hemoglobin and deoxygen hemoglobin. And then this device that I show you gives you the percentage saturation of oxygen in your blood. And what is it is, um, is actually the looking at the concentration of oxyhemoglobin divided by the other oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. That's the percentage, right? Um, in hu healthy human being, most of the hemoglobin in the artery is combined with oxygen. So your uh, SPO, SAO2 should be close to 100%. Now, um, there's another term, SpO2, which is the percentage oxygen saturation of hemoglobin in arterial blood. Basically, they are exactly the same, except when we talk about SpO2 is the saturation determined by a pulse oximeter rather than another method. Okay? A lot of people just use the two synonymously. They say SaO2, but um, it's anything that's measured using a device like this is strictly speaking should be called S percentage SpO2. I'll talk about why. So we say S, the definition of SaO2, percentage of SaO2, right? which is the concentration of oxyhemoglobin divided by the total hemoglobin. Now talk about the physical principle in this. Uh, this is an optical type of medical equipment, right? Using light as um, to detect the oxygen level. So the first principle is the Lambert Spears law. How many of you have heard about Lambert Spears law? Yeah. So what? What you learn it from your physics? From a friend. From a friend. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sure. Well, it's Lambert Spears law. It says you have a you shine a light, the emitter light, the incident light divided by the emitter light. Amount of absorption is equal to concentration. Is A. A is a product of A pine. D, D is the thickness or the optical path length, so it's the distance between of this. And then A is the characteristic of the substance. It's a constant, basically. So what is Lambert Spears law? Your friend taught you, I, I don't know, right? Say, next time when you go to a pub, order a, a jug of beer, well, the Beer's Law, right? So it should come from there. So you order, a, uh, say, uh, a glass of Coors Light, right? A slim glass of Coors Light. Your friend order a glass same size of, uh, what's the favorite drink? <laughs> a pale ale, for example, right? If you know beer, pale ale is darker in color than so you look through, pale ale is darker. Uh, Coors light is lighter, right? So that's because of the concentration difference, right, of the pigment. But if you say, well, I want to get a huge jar of um, uh, Coors light, right? Now, compare with my glass, which one looks darker? It's the big jar, right? And that's because of D. Right? So it's more light being absorbed. So that's the number of So I don't know where you learned it from your pub, you know, your friend from the pub or not. So now there's another um, corollary to that is the total, if you have more than one substance in, in this particular uh, container, uh, so substance X and Y, the total absorption is just the aromatic uh, uh, sum of the two. Okay. Now how do we translate this physical well, law 
into a device like that. We learn about oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin. It just happened that the absorption spectrum of the two is different. Right? So this is oxyhemoglobin, this is absorption spectrum. What is absorption spectrum? It's uh, the relative absorption. You scan it through different wavelengths, right? Different color of light has different, uh, will be absorbed differently by substance. So this is oxyhemoglobin, this is deoxyhemoglobin. So they are different. So this device is what, using what we call differential absorption to try to find out what is the concentration of hemoglobin, what is the concentration of oxyhemoglobin. So um, after a lot of experiment tests, people find, well, you can actually sort of tell from here is um, lambda 1, this is a more big uh, difference between the two. Lambda 2 also is a big difference, but, also, but the, it's reverse, right? The absorption is reverse degree. So this is um, around, this is about red color. This is infrared, you cannot see. So if you look at this device, when I turn it on, you can only see one color. Right? Only red. Because why can't you see the other one? It's infrared. Right? Um, sometimes I can see it if I put on my big ass jacket, become Superman, I may be able to see it, but uh, now I don't. So red, infrared light, two narrow beam of light. So getting into a little bit of math if people are really interested in getting in, right? Now we talk about absorption, right? We have two substances, oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin. We, we have two wavelengths, red and infrared. So we first shine the red wavelength through and then The red rating through one is say the red wavelengths, we establish this equation, right? Using the Lambert speed law, right? With the two concentrations, oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, one is the first wavelength. Then we have the second wavelength. Shine through, we got the second equation. Now, if you look at these two equations, how many unknown are there? Only two unknown, which is the concentrations, right? The others are constants, as we mentioned above. So we can have two independent equations. We can solve the equation. Find out what is C0 and CD, which is the concentration of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. So with that, knowing that, we can calculate our SAO2. Right? Voila. Make a lot of money. Right? Now, however, Things are usually not as straightforward, especially with medical device dealing with human being, uh, especially non-invasive, right? So there are a lot of factors um, that will make this not even may not be possible. What is this? When we look at this equation, we assume these are all constants, but in fact they are not. Why is that? We shine two light through our finger, right? The absorption is not just through the capillaries, right? Well, can you hold up your hand to the, turn your hand, yeah? Sorry. She has all these finger polish and whatever. Actually, I'm surprised it actually works, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because it actually can cut off all the light. And that's true. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, that's one of the uh, contraindication, right? You need to remove the nail polish for using this device. Uh, anyway, so um, the problem is, the other thing is, now, D is the diameter of the blood vessel, right? Should be, right? It's shining through maybe 10 different capillaries or whatever, right? You are, initially, the assumption is, D is a constant, but D is now a con not a constant. So there, if a, no, a is not a constant now. So although uh, A prime, which is the characteristic of oxyhemoglobin, is still a constant, 
but now we don't have a, a constant optical path length. So D is not a constant, therefore A is not a constant, so this equation all of a sudden have, is not just two variables, right? It's more than, well, basically this uh, blue con value is not constant, so we cannot solve the equation. Um, so what do we do? Now there's another area of technique is um, if you know that there is a high, like something that it really, um, we know that the absorption actually works, but because of that, right, different absorption or whatever, um, there's a, there should be correlation between what we measure and the outcome, which is the SAO2 that we want to, want to get. So what we go, we do is to go back to the statistical method to try to um, make correlation between what we measure and sort of cal do some calibration tweaking to get the result that we get. So this device is, we have uh, LED, red, infrared, shine through my finger. There are, this is just optical detector, detect the intensity of light. Right? So the absorption for the oxyhemoglobin, the oxyhemoglobin may be like that. By the way, this is uh, basically your pulse rate, right? Your heart is pumping blood, and then it's increasing, decreasing. Why is this shape? Is because of the uh, uh, expansion, uh, contraction of your blood vessel from your heart rate. So what this device do is to measure the intensity of red light and the intensity of infrared light, and then put it in a ratio R. So this, this R will vary with depending on the, on the oxygen level inside the blood of the patient, right? Then they will use this R number, right? Measure a patient, draw a blood sample, and then say, well, this is 98% with this R ratio, and then another time, right? Draw a blood sample while measuring, sort of make this correlation and come up with some sort of calibration curve to, uh, so that they can say, well, if this measure the intensity like that, this will be the, the SAO2. So that's why it is not exactly the same as SAO2, which we, in the lab, we use our, uh, what we call covert uh, or, or test tube, right, with fixed optical path length so that we can exactly measure what is SAO2. But this SPO2 measure, right, is getting through this sort of approximation calibration to, to get the value. So this is um, how, how it works. And just showing you um, some finger probes, right? Uh, this is a transmissive probe. This is a refractive probe. You can actually put something, both receiver and, and, and the transmitter on the same side of the skin uh, and detect the reflection or scatter uh, uh, light. And there's some pictures how these probes are being deployed. And this is a diagram, as I mentioned, functional building block to allow people to start to design and, and uh, manufacture this device. So quickly, what are the source of error? Right? It's not exactly as accurate as drawing a blood sample and then send it to the lab uh, to do it. Um, there are many, quite a number of errors. Poor perfusion, for example, if you're, you, you, like, poor perfusion is the blood is not uh, able to go to uh, all the extremities. So people with that symptom is they feel cold and the extremities are cold. So basically what it is, is not enough blood going into extremity. And we relied on, on detecting what is in the blood, right? Um, so uh, signal to noise ratio, I'm not going to dwell in the, basically your signal obtained is too small. That is all masked up with noise. Um, excessive signal attenuation, for example, fingernails, right, uh, will attenuate the signal. Um, external interference, right, a lot of uh, different electrical interference. If your signal especially is low, then it can interfere with your, with your measure. Motion, um, if you want to try it out, if you wiggle your finger, uh, it will give you errors or some machine will, will say uh, will not be able to measure. 
um, because if you are moving, it actually changes the optical pathway substantially. Um, substance in the blood. So if you have some color dye in the blood because of some procedure or whatever, it will, it will cause a, a problem. So just in conclusion, um, since I mentioned about biomedical engineers, uh, biomedical engineers use engineering principles to solve medical problems, right? Those, uh, and apply science and math to design and develop medical device for diagnosis and treatment of illnesses and injuries, and also to promote wellness and also ensure safety, okay? And there are some, a couple of references of, of the two devices, if you're interested to read. And thank you very much. <laughs>